Thank you to the organizers and to the local people here uh, for inviting me here and have this opportunity to commemorate uh, Pierre. And I had many things I could say about Pierre, uh, and, uh, but I was giving a different topic. But I will say he was one of the primary reasons I came to Paris to, to start up PCCP, the Paris Center for Cosmological Physics, and to be here. And uh, he's also one of the primary reasons that I went to Hong Kong. <laughs> but it's a, it's a mixed set of things. And it's sort of a, I realize now I have learned lessons from various mentors. One of them was Luis Alvarez, who said, if you, aren't, if you aren't having some projects and experiments fail, you're not taking enough risk. That's before funding got really difficult. So you had to do the work before you proposed. But, so, but in Pierre's case, if you don't have a lot of things you started that you don't finish, for whatever reason, you're not doing enough things. And so Pierre uh, really took on a lot of challenges. I was feeling guilty yesterday that he didn't get to go sailing because as he was coming to the end of his time in, at the APC, I got excited about, he got excited about the Paris Center for Cosmological Physics, which we started, you know, he was looking to that as something that could expand the range of activities in which he was doing things and, and so forth. So I had a lot of good experience with him. I talked to some people yesterday about our experience with the MOOC. But I'm going to go to my topic, which is the future of cosmology, which is no big thing. And uh, you'll see we have the outlines, and this is two out of three dimensions kind of shown, of the time flow of the history of the universe and what's going on. And a lot of things happened. And I will come back to that, but let me show you where we are now. That is, we have this idea that somehow time began. At a very early fraction, there's some kind of quantum gravity or something going on. And out of that emerges inflation, which makes the space time and the perturbations we see, in which we can see clearly from the CMB at 379,000 years. And we look at the present day and we see these modern galaxies and stars and planets and so forth, and eventually life. And that's a pretty simple picture, right? Just everything, right? And we have now really significant observational support for what we call the Lambda CDM, the Lambda being a stalking horse for dark energy. And uh, I have two plots here that show a plot of omega and a matter versus omega and the dark energy, or omega and lambda on the other side. And the only reason I show two of them is one of them shows a, a broader range, but you can see the cosmic microwave background measurements show that the universe is fairly close to flat, but only flat for, or, and with great precision with a small amount of the omega being in matter, that is the roughly around 0.3, and that uh, you, you get from clusters, you get from baryon acoustic oscillations in the, in the other graph, and you get from the supernova, the accelerating universe measurements, a, a, a region where they all overlap, which is a flat universe, very close to a flat universe, but where the dark energy is about 70% of the energy in the universe present day, and the, and the dark matter is around 30%, right? This is rough, rough scale, right? Actually, 4% is the baryonic uh, matter, but uh, 4.5%. So these, these are, you know, indications that through several different techniques, we're seeing the same answer in a consistent sort of way. But it's much more than that. This is, this is you'll see this, the steps as this goes on. And so a key step in this, and I took this picture, uh, this Hubble picture, that shows you what we're doing is we're looking at concentric shells of space around us. And when we do that, we look back at time if we measure from a different epoch. So the Hubble deep field is measuring the universe back when it's about uh, a billion years old. The, ultra, the Hubble ultra deep field when it's between 400,000 and 700,000 years old and so forth. But before that are the first galaxies, the first stars, the dark ages, and then the, the cosmic microwave background. So we have this picture where we're seeing the history of the universe by looking at concentric spheres around us right? that allows us to make the observations. Okay, and from that, we deduce that roughly 70% of the energy density in the universe is in dark energy, 25% is in dark matter, and 4.5% approximately is in the standard model particles, the baryons and electrons and so forth, the neutrinos. 
And so that's part of the picture that we're coming to, and uh, hopefully. And then we have, in any, any model, you always have the constituents, and then you have the equations that govern the behavior of the constituents. And what we have here is, in comparison to the standard theory of particle physics, uh, to use John's term, the, is we have a simple equation, which is the gross scale equation, which is the, the Friedman, LeMaitre, Robertson, Walker metric, right? And the treatment of everything as a perfect fluid. And then we have perturbation theory. That per, but our perturbations start at 10 to the minus 5 and go down. And so the higher order terms go down fast right, in a certain sense like that. So you can, you can, you, you have the dynamics of how the, the constituents work and you can do the calculations. And those are fairly straightforward calculations. So that's the standard, that's the sort of now become the sort of standard model of cosmology that, or the standard theory of cosmology that you have these basic constituents, you can treat them like fluids, and then you can apply these equations and perturbation theory and do the calculations. And you can do quite well with the calculations. Okay, so let's go back a little bit in history. In the upper left is a plot of the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background. And this plot is almost 20 something years old. And what you see here underneath in red is the Planckian curve. And then what you see is the data points. And what you remember is for a black body radiation, one data point determines the whole curve. So every data point determines the whole curve, and all those curves kind of line up together. And they line up at the 10 to the minus 4 level, or slightly better. So you think you're on the right track, that it really is thermal radiation coming from the early universe. And you're looking now for deviations from that between 10 to the minus 5 and 10 to the minus 8 level. That's the, the sort of level we, we predict from our model, that, that the first order, we're seeing the right thing, and we're looking for perturbations at 10 to minus 5 and below on top of that. Okay. And so here was the early data. This is the plot I made up. This is actual sky measurement, not just a made up one color. The, the universe itself is extremely uniform on a large scale, the dipole, and then out here are the, the small perturbations at the 10 to the minus 5 level. And you start making up this model of the universe. So this is the, the current uh, visible horizon. And you can go backwards, and there's an accelerating part, and there's a decelerating part where structure forms. There's an accelerating part, or something like it, which calls inflation. And you just make the model up, and you use particle physics as much as you can, and you add the extra terms. I mean, you add inflation, you add baryogenesis, you, you add dark matter to the standard model, and you put the simplest versions of those in, and you do the calculations, and you get the answer that agrees with the observations extremely precisely. That, that's a curse and a benefit, right? Okay, so this is sort of a plot that I just picked out to show you the, the spectrum observed, the angular power spectrum observed in the temperature cosmic microwave background and in the E mode polarizations. That is a particular set of polarizations. And you can take this cosmic microwave background from a redshift of around 1100, fit it to this model, and then do this parameter fit and we have six parameters in our model instead of 11 like John had or 17 like other John had. The, the, you know, but essentially you have six and you're able to make these predictions and see these curves come out very cleanly. And if, if, you, if you look, there's a lot of wiggles and bumps. You have data in order to fit these, but in fact you add observations from other things in order to make this, uh, this uh, standard theory of cosmology, okay? And so, uh, I see it went off the edge here. Um, so the observations are an extremely good fit to the cosmological model. So we have the cosmic microwave background, and we have the galaxy surveys. And you, if you make a plot, and this is the log of the of power spectrum of the, of the three-dimensional power spectrum versus wave number, and the long wavelength, which the CMB measures here in red, and the shorter wavelengths, which the uh, galaxy surveys and the Lyman Alpha surveys give you. And then there's the big point out here. There are those same acoustic oscillations we see 
showing up in the C and B power, angular power spectrum show up in the matter power spectrum because there's slightly more galaxies out at about 140 megaparsecs over age, over little age, and so forth. So you've got that. We now have, uh, you know, sky surveys. This is a picture from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey just to show you. You make this map of stars on the sky, and then you estimate the three-dimensional difference by using the redshift, and you project that out into these slices on the sky. This is a panel which has 120,000 galaxies in it, which is about 10% of the survey from the Baryon Acoustic Oscillations Spectroscopic Survey, which is BOSS for short. Right? So that's that we're, we're learning from particle physicists to give things cute names. Right? And so you, you have the situation where you can make these predictions and you see the data falling the, the, the predictions extremely precisely, and people are doing desperately the same thing. They're doing the standard theory of particle physics. You're looking for places where there's tensions or where there might be you know, something going wrong with it. But so far, nothing's going wrong with it, which is a curse and a blessing, right? Okay, so now I'm ready to talk about the future because, as you'll see, my prediction for the future is this model is going to be verified again for the next five years extremely powerfully. I'll be surprised if some huge anomalies come up, but we'll see. So the next thing, so I set it down here, the Dark Energy Spectrum Survey Instrument, so DAISY, it's the, the, the original Sloan Digital Sky Survey covered two times h to the minus three gigacubic parsecs. BOSS, the one that I showed you the, the, the picture from, covered six, and DAISY will cover 50. Right? So it's the usual kind of progression. And unfortunately, everything cuts off on the right. I don't, it doesn't on the picture here, but it does for that projector. But what you're really seeing is the Moore's Law in action. This is a plot of time, and this is a plot of number of galaxies you survey. And in this nice log plot, it's just this nice straight line, right? And we're going from 2 million galaxies, 3 million galaxies to 30 million galaxies, right? This, and if you're going to keep going, you know, you've got to, another time, think about going up to 100 million galaxies kind of scale. And so what we're, what, what's going on is you're seeing the, the uh, on my plot, you can see it, 10 million brightest galaxies. Those are the ones that are relatively close by. There is then uh, 4 million large red uh, galaxies. There will be 17 million uh, of these, um, I forget what ELG stands for now, something galaxies. Uh, I'll think of the name of it in a minute. And there will be on the order of two and a half million uh, quasi stellar <coughs> objects, and you get to measure the absorption lines of the Lyman alpha absorption lines in front of that. So for each quasar, you get a whole line of, of points for making these observations. So beginning to flesh out a good wedge out of the past light cone to see what's going on in terms of what's happening. And this is what's going to be going on. This will begin uh, essentially, uh, the thing is being put together now, this will begin next year, 2019. We'll begin to start taking data and it will take on the scale of five years. If things go right, then it will also be reproduced in the southern hemisphere and you will have roughly 50 million galaxies in that kind of a time scale. And that will, you know, it's a question of funding, it's a question of what else happens in terms of what's going on. At the same time, LSST is going to start out, this is measuring the galaxy's locations and the spectra very carefully. LSST is a much bigger light gathering and can be doing more mapping in other areas, so there's different aspects of what's going to go on. But this is, this is the, where the big advances in cosmology lights go forward because now you'll have enough volume where you'll be able to get big samples of baryon acoustic oscillations, which, which are you know, on, on fairly substantial scales. So you can predict what's going to happen for the next five years in terms of galaxy surveys. It's, it's pretty straightforward there. Okay, now here is the CMB angular power spectrum, and again, I'm gonna predict what's gonna happen for the next, next five to six years, and so forth. So on the left is the theoretical kind of plot, which is the various power spectra you can make out of the simple standard model. So there's the temperature-temperature power spectrum, the temperature-E-mode polarization cross power spectrum, the E-mode, I'm sorry, it's faint here, the E-mode, power spectrum, and the B mode from lensing, 
you get E modes gravitationally lensed by intervening material. And you can predict all of these, and these are all based, it's not quite two, two data points to produce all these curves, but it's essentially, it's heavily weighted to a couple of the parameters in the standard model that give you this power spectrum quite, quite precisely. Okay. On the other side, you're ready to know what, ir, what are the gravity waves or tensors before, when, the, when they're outside of the horizon or when they're produced. What are the tensor modes look like from inflation? And this is a plot that we made, and we put r equals 0.1 just so it would fit nicely on the, on the plot, and it was a nice round number. And you predict again TT, TE, you know, EE, and BB from that, from that model. This one is completely predicted from what we already know and from the fact we made some limited observations here. These were, are unknown because we don't know the energy scale of inflation. Right? So those are the things that we're looking for. Okay, so where are we now experimentally? Okay. Well, here's the TT power spectrum. Notice the data points, right? Now, in principle, only a few data points are taken in order to get the, the curve, right? And then that predicts the E modes without any prior knowledge. You predict exactly the E mode curve based on what you got from the TT mode curves. And you can predict the, the B mode lensing from your simple calculations. So this is just taking those, the, that Friedman equations adding the 10 to the minus 5 perturbations and going forward, you make these predictions, right? And so here you are, and what's impressive is look at the error bars on this, which is down orders of magnitude. You know, for me, it was a struggle to get to here, right? And now look where we are now. It's just fairly impressive, but we still haven't seen the B modes, right, from inflation. We've seen that's the place where you're going to look for them because now the, low, the limits are so so low, it's hard to see them between under the TT or the TE mode or the EE because you're already seeing big signals in the EE mode. You've got to see other the B modes in terms of what's happening. Okay, so on here is a hint about what the future is going to be like. These curves fit unbelievably well. They're going to continue to fit unbelievably well, it's my prediction. Right? That, in fact, when CMBS4 is running and is starting to run, you know, it's starting to be mounted, it will end up with error bars that look like this, and they will follow these curves. That's my prediction. It's, it's the same success the standard theory of particle physics has had. The, the, you know, in my lifetime, I saw the error bars go from 1% to 10 to the minus 4. You know, I'd like to see it get down to 10 to the minus 4, but it isn't going to get quite that low because there are other fundamental limitations. So you can predict what the next few years are going to be like in the CMB land. And you can also predict what it's going to be doing is tightening the constraints on the standard theory, but it's unlikely to break the standard theory. That's, that's my guess. And everybody hopes that they'll be able to find the B modes from inflation. That would be the exciting new thing because that would give you one more parameter in order to see what's going on. Okay, so what is the, what is the, stage four or CMB S4. And so the first thing is I draw your attention to this plot, which goes from the year 2000 to 2020, so slightly into the future. And this is the sensitivity, uh, you know, basically in pixels in micro Kelvin. Now, luckily don't put Kobe in because Kobe would be up here. And it would be embarrassing, right, for, for me, but that they wanted to fit on the page. And what you can see is as time has gone by, the experiments have been getting better and better. We're in this region right, we're in this region right now where people are upgrading uh, from the previous measurements into what I would call, you know, CMB S3 and a half is what's going on. And CMB S4 is going to kick in in another couple of years. That's the, you can, that's the prediction you can make. So what is that? Well, this is just a nice plank map of the sky and the polarization. Stage four, are ground-based CMB measurements, dedicated telescopes with very sensitive superconducting cameras. What they don't mention is how many pixels, so I'll mention that in the next slide. And they'll be operating from uh, the South Pole, the high, and I'll explain why that is, the Chilean uh, plat uh, plateau, and a northern hemisphere site, and I'll show you that. And these, these are going to have an impact on testing cosmology, but also on testing things like the number of masses neutrinos, 
light relic particles and a bunch of other things. So you can predict that's going to go. You're going to predict how the, the constraints will tighten up. That's, that's pretty, pretty clear. And you can even predict the time scale at which things are going to happen. So here, here is a plot just for adding color. This is a, a Planck map of dust. So you, you realize that it looks pretty, but you're going to look in the holes in order to see what's going on. So here is the time scale. Here's the sensitivity. And here's the number of detectors, right? So we're entering the phase now where we're on the scale of 10 to the fourth detectors. Uh, we're going to go to the scale where we're on the scale of 10 to the sixth detectors <coughs> over, over the next five years. That's the sort of range at which things are going to be going on. And that's going to reduce. The reason you're doing that is you're nearing the quantum limit. And the way you improve is you put more detectors in. Right? If, you, if every detector is working the quantum limit, you just add more detectors, and so you go into the thousands, right? That's, and you go into tens of thousands, and you'll go into the millions. That's the, the, kind of time, the kind of thing that's going to happen. And that's clear that it's starting to happen already. We went from tens to thousand. Now we're, going to ten, now we're building things that are on the scale of 10,000, and then there will be things on the scale of 100,000, and then a million. That's the, that's, it's very clear progressive, and that depends upon continued funding from the various government sources. And it seems likely that this is going forward. It got money to keep going this year, but LSST has to get out of the way. LSST and DAISY have to get out of the way somewhat. Okay, so why, which sites are available? Okay, so this is a plot of the Earth. This is looking down and using satellite data. And this is a, a plot of the atmospheric principal water vapor. And this is a six-year average from 2011 to 2016, right? Okay, so what you will notice is you're looking for a place where there's very little water vapor over your head. And the reason for that is water vapor is variable. You see that when you walk outside, you see clouds. Oxygen is not so variable. If you want to do a really good experiment, you have to be at a place where the signal come in the atmosphere, if you do it from the ground, from the atmosphere is not so severe. So you'd like to go to mountaintops, you'd also like to go to places that are very dry. Well, what's one of the best places in the world? It's Antarctica. That's why the South Pole Telescope is there. It's happened to be at the South Pole for various other reasons. Another good site is the Atacama Desert. One of the things you learn is if you have a high mountain range and the winds are blowing you know, towards, you, towards that high mountain range, the next mountain range over is really a wonderful desert because it's a, in the rain shadow of the giant mountains, okay? And so that's also true here in Tibet. You have the Himalayas, and behind the Himalayas you have another range, and that range is high desert, right? And the same thing is true in Greenland because it's the same combination that Antarctica has, altitude and cold, so that there's not as much water vapor in the air. So those are the four sites from which you can make really good observations from the ground in principle for the small angular scale, okay? So I'll mention a, uh, a experiment that's coming that many of you haven't heard about or have seen much about, and that is the OLLI uh, CMB polarization telescope. And the site is here, and so if you should recognize this is the Indian subcontinent, this is the Himalayas, and this is the uh, Tibetan uh, plateau. Here is the main high mountain range, and behind it is a lower mountain range, but not much lower, that is extremely dry. Okay. So that's why it's been picked as a site. It's in that region of, of Tibet is called Ali. That's, it's not after Alibaba, it's, it's Ali. And uh, here is where the observing site is going to be. Okay. So the Chinese have already built a set of optical telescopes at this site A1, and they're building the Ali CPT-1 at an altitude of 5,250 meters. They're going to build Ali CPT-2 at 6,000 meters. Right? So it's high altitude and dry. That's how you make the atmospheric variations much less. Okay. The, the set of detectors for the telescope that's being readied now is 7,000. Right? That should be ready and observing next year. And for ALI-CP2, there will be more than 20,000. 
Right? And that's a question that the contracts are let, but the question of what's going on. So they're focusing on the frequency of 95 and 150 gigahertz. And the second stage, the first part of the, of the second stage will be the same way. Okay? And so this is the experimental hall for it. This was the, 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 the laying of the foundation for the actual telescope. And you can see the actual high Himalayas behind you. Right? The, the Himalayas are actually really high. You know, when you're standing on 5,000 meters, the Himalayas still tower up above you. That's, that's the thing I noticed. I went, went through a pass and it was quite like that. And you see there's a fairly large crew that, it, that is doing this. This was a ceremony uh, late last summer that they were setting it up. Okay, so what's going on here? All right, so Ali is set in at this height in Tibet. So overhead is this sort of line. It can see all the way to the North Pole. It can see down to here, right? Atacama, that is the, the place in Chile. The, the, uh, you can see either side that way. And from the South Pole, you can see up to here. That's five minutes? OK, I'm running over. I can't give you my wild and crazy stuff then. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> OK, so uh, this, is, this is the idea. So this is a plot which is the Planck dust polarization at 350 gigahertz. You want to minimize that. You also want to minimize the dust. So here's the dust map at the same, at, at a higher, somewhat higher frequency. And what you can see are the targets that Ali has picked. You can see, of course, they've picked low dust, but also not far from overhead. And there is a series of programs they're doing and, you know, have set up to do and to, to arrange. And so this, this marks the foot of the big foray of Asia into modern cosmology and part of a big shift we're seeing, which is Asia's coming up very strongly in a lot of the sciences. Okay, so I was gonna do this wild and crazy thing because I thought it was just before the, the, the break, but I, I was gonna make a prediction for longer than five years from now, which is harder to do, and I had to, to resort to a, a trick or a test. That is, I had to create a thing I call, a recreate a thing called the Copernican time principle as opposed to the Copernican space principle that we don't leave anything special because clearly those are wrong, right? And this is wrong too. But you can say the current cosmological epoch has no specific significance. That means interesting physical processes will continue to take place in the future despite the very decreased energy levels. So you have to be kind of prejudiced. Can you get a cosmological principle in time? And will, will that define the future of cosmology? Will that define the future of, of particle physics? Right? So that, I try to think of a scheme in which that would work. And it's easy to come up with schemes to make that work, it turns out. So I'll give you a couple more, and then I'll get out. So when you normally look at a cosmic timeline, you usually think, oh, look, there's something at one second. There's something at 300,000 years, a billion years. You know, those things stick out to you. People will do these things on these plots, and they only put four or five, you know, phase transitions in, and you think, well, that means if you're near one of those, you're at a special time, right? And Fred Adams made this, this list of, you know, he called a primordial era that's less than, 10, less than a million years, and, and the stellar era, which is a million years to, you know, 10 to the 14th years, the degenerate era, which is neutron stars and black hole, I mean, white dwarfs and stuff, the black hole era, and then the evaporated black hole era, and so on. And, but in fact, if you look at the cosmological principle in terms of present day understanding of the universe, the cosmological principle we used to use when I was a boy, because we didn't have any facts on the sky, we had to make stuff up. And we say, on the largest scales, the universe is homogeneous. Now that's clearly a lie, because it isn't, right? Look around, it's not homogeneous. It's, you have to go to a big scale for this to kind of work, but on the really big scale, it's clear that it does work, and so that's the, the, the kind of thing. So, and also isotropy, the look, the universe looks the same in every direction, and we think the laws of physics are the same everywhere in the universe. Those, those are the, the, the real principles that we kind of assumed in terms of what was going on. And, but if you look at the distribution of galaxies that we mapped, they obviously are not homogeneous, or even quite isotropic, but part of it's because our galaxy is obscuring it. But if you go out and look at the data and look as a function of scale in megaparsecs, right? So here's sort of the scale of the universe, the horizon. 
what you see is the density variation, since so cutoff is delta rho over rho quantity squared. The, the, uh, it, on the large scale, this very homogeneity, very close to homogeneity, but on the small scale, it's not, right? Or look at it this way, when you're looking at it in wave number and power spectrum, this, if you look in density, the density variation is just rising as k. If you do curvature, it's just flat, and then it rolls off, right? It's telling you something that the, 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 the cosmological, what we call the cosmological principle, is actually a result of the initial conditions, right? The fact that we had a homogeneous universe, perhaps given to us by inflation, and anisotropies at 10 to the minus 5 level, and we perturbed by silk damping and other things. We perturbed, we got rid of a lot of those perturbations, but some of them did eventually fragment and grow into black holes and, to, and the galaxies and so forth. So, then this is the stuff. So, some of the people wanted to have, uh, you know, black holes be, the primordial black holes be the dark matter. I, I studied this really carefully. I got excited when LIGO saw these 30 solar mass. You can't make the LIGO ones at all out of primordial black holes, but you can't make more than a couple of percent of the dark matter out of primordial black holes, and so it gets less interesting. So, but you can set a limit on the perturbations, and the initial conditions have to fall through this window, and then you're free to be below these curves, right? So you could have inflation roll down a hill and bump up and do stuff like that. You could try and do that, and that's what Pierre tried, you know, when he we was discussing this with Pierre and, and colleagues worked out a theory where they could have an inflation that would make the primary black holes as the right thing. But it turns out there are other problems with doing that. And so, there's a whole set of cosmological principles. I claim all of them are not right, that there are approximations to what's going on. And, you know, you have an inflation. If you live near inflation, you say you live in a special time. If you live at a later inflation or the dark energy or something, you think you live at a special time. That if there's one every 10 decades, or, you know, every 10 decades, you're going to be near something some of the time, right? So that's the question. Can you make this guy have so many divisions that no matter where you are, you live special, right? And so you can start going down and make the list, but if you go to the right scale, you can start adding stuff in between here, and you really get a, a huge long list. And so I claim what you have to have is a generalized principle, which is that there is energy on all scales, and we need stuff from the 10 to the 28th EV to 10 to the minus 28th EV, Right, and there's going to be a range. It's okay. I can make conformal time and make it finite. I can I can take care of that. So all I need is a global seesaw mechanism, right? That gives me a high energy guy and a low energy guy and some pivot point in the middle, and I can make it work. And I can just keep adding to this thing until I have the the ultralight dark matter, the alp-like particles at 10 to minus 28, and then I can cut off because it's going outside the horizon, right? And so that's why we have a center the Super Everything Institute, right? Superchargers, superclusters, super colliders, and so forth. And as John and Pierre would ask, what about supersymmetry? Okay, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, could you go back to the slide where you're predicting the sort of five years out and you had the uh, the TT and the the temperature curves on the left and the right and and uh, so everything on the left is prediction is is straight take the cosmological parameters we have and they come out all exactly like that you have there's no degrees of freedom it's it's there now what we do in practice is do some fits to it but in fact, the original prediction when we made that was just due to TT fits, and those others came out directly as predictions. Now, here are the observations. They're slightly tweaked up, but they're basically they're, they're, they're hardly changed. So on the right, uh, for the temperature, you have sort of several different curves, red and two different color blues, right. and some data points. And what are, what are the differences there? Can you explain that? OK, so you're, you're talking about this stuff out here? That and the red curve below it, yeah. So the red curve below is the sort of primordial perturbations you would expect. If you go to a small enough angular scale, you start seeing clusters of galaxies and galaxies 
producing signals there. And you have to interpret whether that's the right level or not. And there's various models for what they are. So this part is not primordial. This is what we would call secondary. That is, from large-scale structure having formed you know, clusters of galaxies or galaxies and then emitting additional signals because of the synchrotron radiation or dust or other things. Right? And those are real data points there? The those are real data points. Real. Okay. Thank it's you. sort of amazing how, how much the pro progress there's been. And, you know, when you ask how well, you know, the CNBS-4 is going to do, there's not actually a reason to do much better there. Where you want to do better is in the polarizations. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to come back to your time Copernican principle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you understand the Copernican principle is clearly not a principle, because mm -hmm. clearly within a light year of here, we're in a special place, right? You've got to go many tens of light years to even have a volume where you might consider there are other things as night, solar systems. Now we know there are solar systems. You know, 10 years ago, we didn't know about other solar systems, extrasolar solar systems, or planetary systems, you know. But the fact is, it is special, and galaxies are special. Galaxies, the matter in which their stars is clumped, they're, they're, it's, the Copernican principle is kind of, it's kind of a loose principle. It's basically saying you're not in the center of the universe, that you're in a sort of a typical region, right? And so the, the time Copernican principle, I claim, is that you're not at a special epoch you're at a kind of a typical epoch that you're, there's going to be some events happening. A bunch happened before you and a bunch are going to happen after you. Well, the question I wanted to ask is, uh, let, let me put it in a provocative way. Well, uh, that but, whole thing was provocative. I was yes. counting on this coffee okay. break saving me. Yeah, maybe <laughs> it's related to another yeah. problem. The problem is the cosmological principle it says we want maximal symmetry on slices of simultaneity. Now, yes. this is a heresy. Yes, and in fact, and we, it's not we should, we should talk about maybe maximal symmetry on the light cone, yeah. but not on, on surfaces of yes. simultaneity. Right, and, and that's an issue about whether you have time travel or not. I mean, there's a lot of issues, or the multiverse, that, you know, once you get into this, Copernican principle, you end up getting in the universes strung out after universes. There's a whole lot of horrible things that happen once you, once you go crazy with the Copernican principle. But, the, but yes, the, the answer is correct. We had to have a, uh, you know, you, you, you have to have some mechanism that's going to pr produce a universe which has got the time normal to the, to the symmetric space direction, the nearly symmetric space direction. And in fact, it's a, it's a perturbation, and in fact, you should expect perturbation time. I mean, one thing Einstein taught us is that you can rotate matter, you know, time into, into, into space and vice versa. There has to be a symmetry between the, the spatial kind of stuff. But, you know, we, we don't know how it affects the laws of physics. Are the laws of physics tied to the structure of space-time? Well, uh, I have a small um, provocative <laughs> remark related to um, how we tell the, the, the big public the, the story of the Big Bang. Namely, my question is why people insist on putting the Big Bang before inflation and not at the end of inflation. Mm -hmm. I think the physical Big Bang, the hot Big Bang, is the end of inflation and we don't know absolutely anything yeah. about what preceded inflation. It's a string, so I think we it's should, a string theory we should fault. stop. No, no, nothing to do with, no, nothing to do with string theory. It's the fact that we simply don't know the beginning of inflation. And uh, it could be, you know, there is a paper by Hawking just published yesterday talking about eternal inflation and things like this. The thing we know something about is the hot Big Bang at the end of inflation. And that's where we should put our t equals zero. Thank you very much. So, so we invert the order uh, between Antonio. Th thank you very much again, uh, George. Sorry. 
So this is a, a talk on a project to which Pierre has contributed. Uh, do I need the microphone? Uh, here, when you're here, it's okay. Oh, okay. So this is a project, uh, it's the story and the future of a project to which Pierre has contributed, I would say, critically, more than a lot, in a, in a critical way. And I'm sure he would have given a, a better talk than me. You will get a, a plumber talk here. So the, the basic is LISA, which is a, a gravitational wave detector in space, which is uh, planned since many years and is now progressing rather fast. Uh, is LIGO in space. Uh, the principle is always the same. It's free falling test masses and interferometer. And you measure the, the relative displacement or acceleration of these test masses. The main difference is the sheer size of the detector, which is million kilometer. The distance between this uh, uh, test mass is a million kilometer as compared to kilometer. But uh, and, uh, the main uh, difference for the physics is the frequency of the signals it's targeting to, which are here microhertz to millihertz, instead of being the hertz to kilohertz of LIGO. And the reason why you, get, you have to do that in space, as you know, is that uh, uh, um, the, the surface of the hertz is very noisy gravitationally at low frequency. So if you invade the hertz or the 10 hertz range, the, the gravitational noise of the moving mass in the in a hertz laboratory overwhelms any astrophysical signals. Um, the, in principle, uh, there are differences to LIGO though. I mean, in principle, you could do a detector ju just sending a light beam from one satellite to the other one, and the curvature of the intervening gravitational wave will uh, modulate the frequency of the, of the laser. But obviously, also if the two spacecraft accelerate relative to the local inertia frame, you will see by Doppler effect the signal. So you have to, and, and the spacecraft accelerate because basically the sun is pushing the spacecraft. And so there is, we couldn't find a better way of coping with this problem that carry a test mass in each spacecraft that gives you, because it's protected and it's not excited by the radiation pressure of the sun, gives you an inertia reference and uh, allows you to correct for the acceleration of the spacecraft. And you can easily convince yourself that this is like sending the light beam directly from one test mass to the other test mass. Another difference to LIGO is that there is no way you can do a reflection of light over a few million kilometers. You get very little light on the back, so you cannot do this nice thing that you can do on ground or reflecting the light back and forth a thousand times. And so these are, in reality, you send light from one satellite to the other one, and you send light independently from this satellite to the other one. And so each arm of LISA contains these two independently traveling link from one uh, test mass to the other, and LISA is a detector made by three of these arms. Uh, the current uh, configuration is a couple of hundred of a million kilometer distance, and uh, interf the interferometer is very poor. On ground, you do attometer, here you do picometer, but obviously uh, gravitational waves are a tidal effect, and so in terms of relative distortion of the baseline, it's similar. Uh, as I said, you carry this test mass inside the spacecraft as an inertia reference. Like this is your, the, the, your reference for the, uh, the inertia fall. But if you try to put test masses naively like uh, this uh, lady does here in the space station, sooner or later this test mass drift away. And so you have to play a trick, which is one of the basis of the LISA functioning, which is you measure where the test mass is in the spacecraft, and instead of pushing the test mass to recenter and avoid the collision, you push the spacecraft to follow the test mass, a technique which is called uh, drug-free. Another element that you have to understand in LISA, which makes a difference to LIGO, is that uh, these three spacecraft now follow, in reality, three independent orbits around the sun. And there is a trick in celestial mechanics so that if you pick uh, uh, three orbits that are shifted and tilted and with the proper eccentricity, the three spacecraft with good approximation form a triangle that goes forever. In reality, perturbation makes it to go for about 10 years before becoming too much distorted, but you don't need to do any maneuver or push the satellite 
to keep this formation. And one advantage of going around the sun is that you're doing an, a synthetic aperture telescope. And so LISA has an, a, an ability to locate the source of the gravitational wave in space uh, based on uh, triangulation. And, and this is essential because remember that on ground, the location of the source is mostly uh, thanks to the time delay between the observation with different detector and you don't have different detector in space. Okay, the hardware, uh, so this is one arm. At each end of one arm, you have this complement here where you have a test mass, which is here with a lot of accessory around, we call the gravity reference sensor. Then you have an optical bench where all the interferometer is done. An interferometer consists of two interferometers, one that measures the motion of the test mass relative to the satellite or the acceleration. And then there is another interferometer that measures the acceleration of one spacecraft relative to the other one. And you combine the entire measurement by combining this independent measurement. You need a telescope to both to send the light to the distant spacecraft and to collect the light from the distant spacecraft. Um, in, uh, in reality, you can follow this test mass with your satellite. You have two test masses, so you can follow uh, each one in two different directions, and that's you do. In all other directions, you're forced to apply very little forces to keep the test mass with the satellite, and that you do electrostatically. So the test mass is a cube of gold platinum. It's very dense, so a small cube like that is two kilos, and it's surrounded by millimeter all over the place. There is no mechanical contact. It's real free fall. Why you go low frequency? Now, you have to forgive me. Huh? That's a plumber talk. So if you have a question on the science, ask somebody else. There is Antoine Petitot in the room, for instance, or Stas Pavak, you can ask them. Uh, so why you go low frequency? Well, uh, take the simplest gravitational wave source, which is a binary, right? And the frequency of the wave is twice the frequency of the orbit. And now Kepler tells you that uh, if you go far away, you rotate slowly, right? So uh, the size of the source set the frequency. And so low frequency means big sources. And, and for instance, one example is a, a binary black hole. If the black hole is very large, to stay as a binary, the distance between the two black holes must be large. And if the distance is large, the, the frequency rotation will be very low. If you just put the Kepler formula with one million solar masses, you get 10 milliards, but that's optimistic. You are in the milliards or less uh, with, with this gigantic thing. And obviously, if you go big, you also, if, if you go to big object, you also get a lot of gravitational wave because the intensity emitted is proportional to the square of the mass. And so these are very powerful sources. And so uh, the, the difference, uh, the, if you have to continue listing the difference between ground-based and space-based uh, gravitational wave astronomy, uh, one major difference is the mass. You are now looking at objects that can be up to many million solar masses, and the other, uh, or you can go to objects that are still small mass, but are very uh, largely separated, like uh, binary in the galaxy, or even the LIGO black holes, much before the collapse. So this million solar mass black hole, now you know, they are in all galaxies, in the center of the galaxy, you see the the, the stars evolving around Sagittarius A star, the black hole in the center of our galaxy, and the galaxy collide. Uh, these are, this is a nice animation made by the Hubble Space Telescope that connects the snapshot of the photographs of interacting galaxy. And now we understand that interacting galaxy means that you're forming a binary with these two supermassive black hole, and when these two supermassive black hole collide and form a merger, it's very similar to what happened to LIGO, but instead of being a few tens of solar masses, these are a few million solar masses that merge into a single black hole. And the, the power emitted here, it scales with the, with the dimension. And I think this is true also for LIGO. The energy emitted in form of gravitational wave during that collapse is larger than the entire energy emitted as electromagnetic wave by the, by the, uni by the rest of the universe in the same time. Uh, because they are so massive, this is a plot where you have the redshift, the mass of the two binary, and the signal-to-noise ratio. And you see that still, for some uh, special masses that are quite common, you still have 100 of signal-to-noise ratio up to uh, a redshift of 20. So if this black hole exists, basically, wherever they are, they are detectable by LISA. And, because, and you measure things with the 
the promise is to measure this thing with a, an exquisite precision. So measure the luminosity distance. I'll come back to that. The gravitational wave signal gives you uh, the luminosity distance to the to the source. It uh, measure for the most intense. Uh, you can measure the location to a fraction of a degree. Uh, you measure the mass with a high precision, you measure the spin, and you measure not only the spin magnitude, but even the orientation of the spin vector. So this is precision um, gravitational wave uh, measurement on a, uh, on a system like this. And if you compare with what you can do from ground, I mean, this is the fantastic signal in September 15 from LIGO, uh, you know, the, this is the kind of signal-to-noise ratio we have now. We will certainly improve a lot, and this is the, where the, the source was located. If you compare with one of these monsters, we are talking something which is, you know, as close to recombination as you can think with an enormous signal-to-noise ratio so that the same plot will show at least in the part which is of highest amplitude with very large signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, one thing that the uh, black holeist, how do you call a, a, <laughs> a scholar keeping with black hole, uh, have very large appetite is that this black hole, in uh, going through the capillarian phase and then to the final spinning phase, mm -hmm. any black hole crosses the Lisa band. And so by detecting many of those at different distances, you end in doing a sort of stratigraphy of the universe so that you can do the merging, the merger history of the galaxies, how the galaxies have been formed in time by the merger of smaller galaxies and smaller black hole. And, and obviously the people have a high appetite to be able to say from that uh, how the, black, the primordial black hole was formed in the first place. So this is uh, one of the favorite plot by Carson Danswan on the, the, of the black hole scenario in the 30s when LISA will be active and a lot of, of, facil of ground-based facility uh, will be active. And you may see how the effort on black hole will be uh, very complementary with uh, large mass uh, investigated optically and, uh, and uh, small masses investigated from ground by ET that we all hope will be. And in the center, this big area covered by ESA. Maybe uh, it's not so popular in this environment that the ESA, the, the European Space Agency, is investing a lot of effort on black hole because the other large mission that is part of the Cosmic Vision Program and actually is the L2 slot, uh, one slot before LISA, is Athena, which is an X-ray an uh, um, observatory, a large X-ray observatory, which is targeting basically the same supermassive black holes and uh, X-ray emission from uh, the final uh, merger event. And I'll come back to that. So you may say I'm advertising the ESA massive black hole program, because it's a real one single package studying black holes to uh, <clears throat> one thing that, um, one, one source that I like really very much of Lisa is the, you hear the sound because there is a sound, this is a simulation, it's a small black hole, a stellar mass black hole or a compact, another compact object falling into a massive black hole. It's a high non-Keplerian dynamics because the field is strong, so it's no planar orbit and uh, it sends uh, waves to the very end and uh, the very end is abrupt if an event horizon exists and this is unique to the system. The, the small object falling in the event, into the event horizon gives a final termination of any gravitational wave which uh, I would say is a, is a good proof of the existence of an event and uh, you can do physics with very high precision, you can measure the quadrupole moment and you can compare with a with a care metric, and uh, what the people say is that any departure from the standard black hole, uh, either within general relativity because it's a uh, strange environmental, uh, a strange environment around the central black hole, or because uh, general, there are departures of general relativity on other things, each one has its own fingerprint in the, in the signal uh, shape, and so can be studied in detail by this signal. And it's amazing, I took this from one of your, I'm not part of Lisa, from one of, of your last meeting that people keep, uh, it's now considering that there is a, 
a, a non-zero probability that a binary black hole falls into these big black holes. And so you will have a phase where you have high frequency black hole from this binary and the low frequency black hole for two binaries falling into large black hole. I found this mind boggling. I don't know if it is true, but it's certainly fascinating. As I said before, um, a gravitational wave detector measured the distance for chirping signals, they measure the distance to the source. Basically, from the rate of uh, slippage of the frequency, you can calculate how much was the intensity of the signal at the source. And so by measuring the, signal, the intensity here, you can get the luminosity distance without any um, uh, you know, standard fiducial candle. However, you don't know, uh, you don't know the, the redshift, because this gives you the distance already redshifted. And so to, to, do, to contribute to a plot where you plot redshift toward luminosity distance, you have to find a counterpart. And um, again, Athena comes into play because the people uh, now think that uh, the, uh, the surrounding of this supermassive black hole will be full of gas, and this gas, uh, this gas will emit. There are calculations that even the, the X-ray emission will have a chirp in it because of the rotation. Again, don't quote me on this. I'm just reading the literature, as you. And so again, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the time frame where Lisa is going to fly, we could have a quite effective way of getting uh, electromagnetic counterpart. Now, if you get the redshift of the source and the luminosity distance, we are talking now of Z around between 1 and 10, a redshift between 1 and 10. And so this will be, maybe it's not the same precision of emission like Euclid, but will certainly be a totally independent way of tracing the, the redshift distance uh, plot. And uh, there have been studies, I and mean, we have an author of the studies here, uh, where uh, with, the, with the small black hole falling in the big black hole, you may even... Uh, try to get the, the redshift by a fitting procedure to the existing galaxies and so get the, and extend the curve also to the shorter redshift. And um, oh. Now, up to now it was big things, right? Low frequency because uh, one, of the thing, one or two of the things are so big that they cannot get closer. But even small things, when they are far away, they emit gravitational wave in the LISA frequency range. And specifically, one major source of gravitational wave, even too much, even too many gravitational wave, are galactic binaries. Uh, in, uh, if I had given a talk, um, if I had given a, this talk three years ago, I would have made a big fuss of this. There are a few of these binaries that we know by name, we are measured optically, we know the, the periodicity, and so we w were calling this verification binaries, and we were saying, even if from, from the ground we didn't detect anything, LISA will detect them, because we calculate the signal with very little uncertainty. This big, uh, <laughs> this big argument is gone now, right? Because we now know there are uh, um, uh, gravitational waves. Uh, it remains that LISA should be able, in a four years, I think, mission time, be able to resolve a few 10,000 of this um, uh, gal uh, this galactic binary, mostly white dwarf binaries, and uh, it would be interesting to compare with the catalog that Gaia, another mission by the European Space Agency, is delivering, and, there are, and the astronomers look forward to cross-reference this, uh, this uh, visible uh, census of binaries with, uh, with um, gravitational sensors. There, there may be binaries that are not visible in the, in, in the optics because they are dark. And certainly we know that there will be five minutes. Huh? No, no, no. It's uh, 16 minutes I'm talking. You're trying to recover on me. But I'm not doing bad. Um, and, and certainly we know that the rest of the binaries will form a background, a foreground, that will certainly, we were discussing with Gabriele, will certainly be a problem if you're after cosmological background, uh, because this will be indistinguishable. Well, I'll skip because I have now a, a new chairman. <laughs> I'll, I'll skip this thing, and, uh, but there is something that you may want to notice that just after the detection of the the announcement of the detection of the binary by LIGO, 
the people published papers showing that if Lisa had been up, the signal from the two uh, black hole when they were separated, were largely separated, would have been detected by Lisa and uh, tracked for almost a year so that uh, to give an advanced warning to the ground-based detector and detect the signal. And so this is called multi-frequency uh, uh, astronomy. And obviously there is a lot you can learn by tracking the signal of this system all across uh, all these phases and so on and so forth. If you want to know all the nice things you can do with LISA, just read the uh, science requirement document. Is that public? And where uh, a list of scientific objectives you can do with LISA. Now let me tell you where we stand. And to let you know where we stand, we have to make a little history. Uh, LISA started around the year 2000. ESA adopted it as a cornerstone in fundamental physics. But very soon, in 2001, uh, Isa decided, well, that's all fascinating, but is it going to work, right? It's a, it's a brand new technology, is it going to work? And uh, the major doubt was, you want this test masses to accelerate just because of the curvature due to the wave. And what about if they accelerate because there is a much more mundane force that accelerate the test masses and you think these are gravitational waves? If you... If you, so you have a requirement in terms of how well you can suppress a stray force that accelerate test masses. And this requirement is awful because it's femto g. Uh, it's, uh, if g is the gravity of the Earth, it's femto g. And uh, fe you, there is no way you can test femto g on ground in 1g. And even worse, any other space mission that has used free-falling test masses, the last one had in flight, is microscope, is three or four orders of magnitude worse than what you need for LISA. And so the people say, yeah, that's a great idea, but is it feasible? And it's such a great idea that we will give you money to do a, a significant test. Now, how significant is the test? This is a, a sensitivity spectrum for LISA. Uh, the, the only purpose of this plot is to say at low frequency is all forced noise. And forced noise is a local problem. It's uh, something mundane like a molecule colliding with your test mass and, ac and accelerating the test mass relative to the local inertial frame. It doesn't require two satellites to test forced noise. And all the rest of the noise is all local. Everything is local in LISA except for the frequency noise that you beat by doing interferometry, right? So 90% of the noise is generated locally. And so that opened the possibility of doing a test in a spacecraft that tests 90% of the error budget, does this with the same hardware you had to fly to LISA. We were very optimistic at the time. And so we started, uh, where Lisa decided, uh, ESA decided to do a test mission. At the same time, it decided to go into a formulation study for Lisa. And so in, in 2004, we got uh, the real mission. We signed a contract. And, uh, and this is the, the email that you had just shown. And it's in the same time frame that uh, Pierre wrote uh, this email to me saying, we want to be, it's a, we've, Lisa is strategic for us, we want to be part of Lisa. And uh, somebody said, he was focused on the task, right? And, and so it just uh, two or three weeks after this email, he told me, well, CNES is a bit cold, not about Lisa, but putting money in Lisa Pathfinder. Well, he did some work, and so in October 2004, he said, well, I learned that CNES is putting the money in Lisa Pathfinder, and that they did. And so in, we had a, a, a big get-together meeting in Trento to form the team in 2005. And you see Pierre uh, telling what is the French uh, role in Lisa Pathfinder. So the, going back to Lisa Pathfinder, the idea is that to test this uh, acceleration noise, the parasitic forces, you don't need the one million kilometer. And so the concept of Lisa Pathfinder is very easy. You take those two... LISA test masses and you squeeze into a, a single satellite. And then you carry interferometer and you measure the relative acceleration of these two test masses. Unfortunately, contrary to LISA, you cannot follow two test masses at once along a line. And so, and this is the limitation of the test. You follow one test mass with, the, with your satellite and the other one you have to push very gently. We try to push very, very, very gently, but you still have to push, so expect the thing to be more noisy than LISA, but still uh, indicative enough. So 
we did it. We went to far away from the Earth at L1. We took these two test masses. This is a rendering. I'll show you the hardware in a moment. It's gold platinum, very dense, two kilos, very non-magnetic, very everything. Uh, the optical bench is an ultra stable structure built with the same technique you use to join the fiber to the mirrors of Virgo and LIGO. Uh, you carry this structure with electrode to give forces in the direction you need to give forces. And there are other tricks you have to play. You have to carry ultraviolet light to discharge these test masses because there is no grounding wire. So they keep being charged by cosmic rays. And uh, you have to have a KG mechanism. You block this thing with one ton at launch. Otherwise, uh, it rattles and breaks the satellite. And then you have to inject in this very precision orbit, a big nightmare, etc., etc. So if you want to see the hardware, uh, this is the, the test mass while it was assembled, surrounded by its electrode. It fits into uh, this box. Uh, it's uh, at the end, the, the test mass is a, like a mirror of uh, LIGO, so you need micron alignment precision, otherwise it doesn't work. And here is the optical bench, that's a rendering, but this is the real thing. It's built with this technique of hydroxy bonding, where you put a, a, a drop of, uh, hydro, of sodium hydroxide and uh, the glass is reformed. You get a few minutes to make the alignment of the entire structure. And uh, anyhow, it was precise, it was aligned to Micron, and uh, it's an, uh, been a jewel. And here you see the entire complement held together by glass, because glass is the only uh, mechanically stable structure. And uh, if you want to see the final complement going into the satellite, that's the final complement. And here, in the interest of time, I'll go in parallel, and you see the satellite being assembled on uh, the Vega launcher in Kourou where in uh, uh, December 2015, after a few year developments, a few, uh, five more years this than expected development, uh, we launched. Uh, set, six, seven, you may know that Kourou quatre, is in French Guinea, so the, deux, the un, launch is in French. Top, and and, uh, we, we navigate for a month, and uh, during this navigation, we turn on the instrument. A few people here were there. Everything turned on successfully. Uh, we had a second major event, uh, which was releasing the test mass in free orbit, you know, because we were all afraid of this effect, where you have pushed this test mass with your finger for a month, for a year, and then you go to release and it doesn't release, and we released, and so the project now? manager <laughs> and was I rather happy of being able to release, and then we went into operation, we operated for uh, almost a year. So I'll go very quickly through what we found. Uh, what were we requested to find? Well, this is our requirement for LISA, but they say, well, you know, you have this problem with the acceleration and so on. So use relaxed requirement. You, instead of being below this line, you're allowed to be below this line, which is 10 times uh, worse in amplitude. And even more important, you don't care about the low frequency because the low frequency testing requires a lot of time and money. And what were we expecting to say? Well, the, the error budget is a book, like in Virgo, right? It's a book of possible entries that may uh, disturb you. But the two dominating sources we were expecting was, one, the noise coming from the need of exerting a little force on the second test mass. And here, the voltage is noisy, so the more force you, you are prepared to, to apply, the more the system is noisy. And the other big source was the... Einstein Brownian noise, the collision with molecules, you have the same problem in Virgo and LIGO, and uh, the higher the pressure, the worse the noise. And uh, the, the two contribution, we could calculate the two contribution, we were expecting the combination of this thing. Then at high frequency, you're limited by the interferometer. We didn't need such a precise interferometer, but what the heck, we had to fly something for LISA, so we decided to fly a nine picometer interferometer. So we were expecting something like that. And so we went into operation on March 1st, and bang, we were on the prediction except for the interferometer, which was much better than expected. Instead of being 10 picometer, it was 35 femtometer per root hertz resolution. Now, the, the dominant source here is this noise due to the fact that you have to push this test mass. To, and why you have to push the test mass? Basically, you have to push the test mass because gravitationally speaking, this test mass pulls this one. Actually, all this piece of matter here makes a big gravitational pull on this test mass. 
And so we try to minimize this by measuring every single piece, the position and the mass of every single piece, and put another heavy mass on the other side to compensate. But obviously there is an error, and we were happy if the error was of the order of a nanometer per second square, 0.1 uh, nano g. But it turns that we had done much better, much better, uh, almost a factor 20 better, and so we could decrease this control and reduce the noise. And so uh, as soon as we realized that, the noise went down. And uh, the noise w went down here because of this re reduction of the actuation, it went down here because this is the Brownian noise due to the molecules, and because our system is vented to the outer space, the pressure keeps going down, keeps going down, and the Brownian noise goes down. Anyhow, we published, this was a very political paper because it had a big impact in the decision process on LISA, and so in, 2000, in June 2016, we published this first result here uh, that I would say made a big change for LISA together with the detection of the gravitational wave from uh, LIGO. I think I'll skip this, and so after uh, a, a year and a half of operation, uh, because of the reducing of the pressure and because of this reducing of the actuation, we went to the final published paper that, as you may see, well, we don't even remember what w the requirements were for Lisa Pathfinder. Uh, the acceleration performance we got is better by factor two than the Lisa requirement, and so we have demonstrated the Lisa requirement. And if you want to see what is the effect of this acceleration noise on uh, your measurement? Uh, this, is, uh, this is a Cartes of Antoine. This is a simulated acceleration between two test masses in LISA because of the gravitational wave from a binary black hole. And the red line is the noise in LISA Pathfinder. And uh, to notice that this is noise, you have to zoom in, and then you see it's noisy. So that, that gives you an impression of the signal-to-noise ratio of this instrument. So we got green light for LISA as soon as we got this. And I must say, I have to quote another rule uh, among the many that Pierre uh, mentioned. Uh, Lisa had set up in the, almost the same time frame a final uh, advisory team to decide what to do on gravitational waves. And, uh, and, um, and uh, uh, the committee concluded that uh, interferometry was the way to go. And so this was an essential element to get the final approval of LISA June last year in 2017 as the uh, third large mission of the Cornerstone program. The sad thing is that uh, I was shortly after I was given the honor to push the button and kill LISA Pathfinder for good, but that's another story. So LISA is charging ahead. Uh, the formal launch date for L3 is 2034, but everybody would like to, uh, everybody is uh, trying to advance this time by a few years. So uh, we are already in phase A. There is a contract to industry that has gone up uh, just now. So the phase A with industry uh, has started for a formulation, for an adoption of the mission uh, in the framework of the early year, uh, of the early 20s. And uh, the Dream Team, it's a, a consortium between ESA, which is in the lead, NASA, which is giving a substantial contribution to LISA, and another 10 of the member states of ESA uh, contributing to it. And obviously the Dream scenario is to see, to advance the launch of LISA so that LISA and Athena can basically fly together and form this extremely powerful uh, supermassive black hole observatory together with the rest. And I borrowed a picture, uh, a slide from the self-presentation of Gunther Hasinger, which is now the new director of science in LISA, in, in ESA, which is presenting the two as a single case uh, and for good. It was not everything a piece of cake. Uh, just to mention where Pierre was instrumental. I mean, Pierre was really instrumental. You see, he was at some point, he has been in the advisory structure of ESA in various, uh, in various uh, functions. Uh, last time he was in the SSAC, uh, representing fundamental physics, which was the way of calling Lisa at the time. Uh, and uh, and uh, very soon he has to cope with difficulties right and uh, we were over budget we were late and uh, it was i would say it was the scientific charisma and intelligence of pierre played a lot of role in preventing this major crisis and not to kill this you, you have to realize that if lisa patfander had been killed we wouldn't be here discussing right and so i i i hand here with the 
one of our last happy moment together. This is the Lisa Symposium in 2016, uh, which we, where we were celebrating the success of Lisa Pathfinder, and it was a very, very happy moment uh, for Pierre too, and I think well deserved. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan, for this fantastic talk. I have to add, I was at CNES, the review committee, of course, uh, Pierre was presenting it at approximately this time, 16. It's the first time in my life where the review committee from CNES was more, more enthusiastic than the people <laughs> proposing it, and it was completely, complete change. We were saying, but probably, said, no, no, it will work. They were completely <laughs> enthusiastic yeah. about yeah. it. Yeah. So yeah, 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 uh, thank yeah. you very much. For, uh, this super plumber uh, talk. I mean, <laughs> so do you have, yeah. You have been talking about the spin of the black holes, the merging black holes. There's also a spin of uh, another actor that is important, and it's the spin of the photon that goes between the mirrors. Help, help, help. <laughs> <laughs> now, no. my question is precise. Yeah. In all calculations, we neglect the spin of the photon. In you gravity. mean the spin of the photon propagating? The laser beam. Ah, the laser beam. Okay. okay. So, uh, in yeah. addition to lensing, if you if you uh, take into account the spin of the photon, you get birefringence. So, my question is: Do you have the possibility to polarize your laser beams in order the laser, to see? The laser beam is polarized. It's polarized. It wasn't in Elizabeth Thunder, but. Mm -hmm. uh, the LISA optics will be polarized where you discriminate beams because of polarization. In LISA Pathfinder, for instance, we had the beam, hinge, uh, the beam hitting the test mass was doing that to discriminate the ingoing. In, in LISA, the plan is that it, uh, you discriminate with polarization. So you have two, two beams of the two polarizations? You have two beams with two polarizations. Mm. However, mm. Uh, uh, vacuum birefringence. Uh, you're far away from any source, so this should be a vacuum refringence experiment. True. And I think that sensitivity is far away from people like Pivulas or other people do. I mean, uh, yeah, but the, I, the I, gravitational I, wave might induce an additional birefringence. I would expect that, that there are many V over C factors there, right? It's, uh, There's no V over C in birefringence. Really? Mm. Yeah. I'm, I, I must say, with all due respect to my beloved colleague in interferometry, the interferometry of LISA is not uh, the most powerful interferometry. It's a fantastic interferometry because it's a pico, it's a, a picowatt interferometry because you're collecting very little light, right? So if you are expecting a LISA to contribute in a place where you need a lot of light to do experiment, I wouldn't put my expectation there very high. John. Um, is the success of uh, Lisa Pathfinder indirectly a test of the equivalence principle and at which level? Not really. Not, Not really, really because there is no clear source uh, in which you you, we're not measuring a, 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 an acceleration at a given frequency. So uh, the, the closest gravitational signal we could try to detect is the gradient from the moon, but it's a very weak signal and it's off-band, so the signal-to-noise ratio is not very large. One of my colleagues sooner or later will search for the signal from the moon. Now, if the signal of the source is so small, your sensitivity to equivalence principle is... Uh, okay. We have been pestered to see if Lisa Pathfinder was a, a proof that MOND are wrong, but we resisted <laughs> that attempt. Uh, there was, yeah. Yeah, so uh, how soon could you launch Lisa? So technically speaking, uh, people think that could be launched in 31, 32, which is, by the way, at this moment, the expected launch date of Athena. You must realize that LISA, being an earlier development phase, obviously is much more advanced, right? Because the problems come later, right? So, but if LISA could maintain 32 and Athena could maintain 32, 
we could have a fantastic package there. However, it's uh, programmatically not easy because launching two large missions at once, it's, uh, it's something that ESA probably um, has to find a way of doing. But certainly this is one of the tasks of Gunther, finding more resources to have both in orbit at the same time, which is a dream observatory scenario. Uh, could you please remind me how long LISA would be operational? The baseline is, well, it's in a phase A study. However, uh, according to the proposal, the baseline is four years, right? Four years. But consumable and things on board uh, should last 10 years. And usually if they last and nothing happens, this mission gets extended. Right? But the, ba the, the base mission is four years. And I should ask it privately. Very silly question, probably immediately wrong. Uh, cosmic rays, can, it, can, can they affect at all? Uh, so uh, cosmic rays, as, uh, as I said before, cosmic <laughs> rays charge the test mass. Let's see if I can spot, uh, no. Yeah, cosmic rays charge the, keep charging the test mass because there is no grounding wire on the test mass. So if you see this animation, if you look at this animation, here you see UV light being shown on the test mass uh, to extract the charge. And charge noise, because this is a Poisson, uh, if you have a stray electric field, every time you get a charge, you get a step in force, and, and so it's Poissonian noise. It's well under control, and uh, Lisa Pathfinder showed that it's well under control. Another question that people ask is, uh, what about exchange and momentum? That's negligible. That's, I was thinking more on exchange yeah. of momentum, but that's unless there are very high energetic particles that obviously yeah, we haven't wonder. detected and so on. Okay, so thank you again very much, Stefano.